This is the Money Hour with your host, Tina Mitchell, on Alternative Talk, AM 1150. Now, back to the show with local mortgage and finance expert, Tina Mitchell. Welcome back to the Money Hour with your host and mortgage expert, Tina Mitchell, right here on 1150 AM KKNW, the Saturday, June 14th show. I've built a network of elite industry professionals every week sharing their knowledge and expertise to my listeners. I have three great ones in studio today. And again, if you want to talk with any of them, please pick up the phone one 855 1150 Again, my show number is one 855 400 1150 or online at themoneyhour.com. And if you are hearing this show at a different time or day, you're listening to a rebroadcast. But I am here to assist and help you with any questions that you have. And again, track, directly connect you with any of my guests. In studio right now, Julie Booth with Booth Escrow. A purchase of a home involves a series of parties to make it happen. And it's an important, important part of the process is the transfer of the funds. And that's what escrow does. And Julie, being the owner of her escrow, escrow company. I'm sure she's got a wealth of information to share with us. Julie, thank you so much for coming into studio. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming back. I'm excited. And a little background about Julie. Julie is the founder and owner of Booth Escrow, and her office is located in Redondo neighborhood of Federal Way. I grew up in Federal Way, and Redondo didn't live in the Redondo area. I wish that I did, (laughs) but it was a beautiful, it's a beautiful area. She has her designated escrow officer licensed by the Department of Financial Institutions and is backed by a million-dollar fidelity policy and a million-dollar E and O policy. She is here to share with my listeners everything about escrow. So, Julie, let's just go ahead and start it off with for those of my listeners that uh, don't understand what escrow is, uh, break it down for me. Well, there's a lot of different types of escrow, but essentially, the the term escrow is defined as a neutral third party who holds money and documents, and does, the transaction is not completed until the terms um, have been met. Mm-hmm. So um, essentially just a neutral third party. And I think it's important that people understand that because a lot of times they go to escrow to sign their paperwork and think that they actually are going to get advice or or something of what to do on that process. But really, you're just there as a third party representing the contract to make sure everybody understands what's happening, not to give any legal advice or suggestions. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So why do people go through an escrow office instead of just using uh, signing papers through their bank? Well, many banks do not have separate escrow departments or employ limited practice officers or escrow officers. Now, that could change with the new rules coming into effect by the CFPB this next year with the new disclosures. Love CFPB. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and I know in Washington State it's required to close via escrow. So there's, you know, in some states you don't have to use an escrow company, correct? But in Washington well, State? Uh, attorneys can close re- and do close real uh-huh. estate transactions. So you've got independent escrows, you've got title companies, and you've got attorneys all closing. Yep. Real but, estate but, but, you've got, you, but you've got to have that representation. Yes. yes. Well, you can close your own, but how many lenders will fund an individual exactly. trying to, you know, conduct their own transaction? It's makes, not going to happen. Makes sense. So, Julie, what about a listener that wants to purchase real estate without their spouse? Interesting question. This has mm-hmm. been brought up a lot here recently. Um, you can purchase without your spousal um, acquiring with you, but mm-hmm. the spousal interest has to be addressed because this is a community property state. Yes. And otherwise, there'll be a cloud on your title policy uh, that would have to be cleared at the time you resold the property. That's if you're a cash buyer. Mm-hmm. If there's institutional financing involved, that lender is going to make absolutely sure that that spousal interest is handled. And you want to make sure if you're doing, there could be different reasons why you could have a spouse not on the loan, but they want to be on the title and they're going to be on the contract. And every bank actually has something different as far as how that contract is compared to how they're taking title if one of the spouses left off the loan. But um, you just want to make sure that you're finding out what what that means when you're not actually on the loan or on involved in the real estate transaction. First thing I try to do is bring everybody together and find out what the... What the um, 
the true point is. Well, mm-hmm. Why is this person not acquiring? What is the expectations of the parties yes. involved? Um, and by the way, a prenup does not supersede this requirement to address the spousal interest, even if the property was yours. Really? Right. A I prenup, didn't know that. Prenup doesn't work. Wow. Title companies are absolutely going to want to address that spousal okay, interest. Okay. I guess, I guess that makes sense. So, Julie, let's talk about, so you mentioned what the reason is. Let's talk about the spouse um, having been released because of their credit issues. So if, if you're on a mortgage, they go based on the lowest credit score from the two borrowers or three borrowers, how many are on the loan? So if their credit doesn't qualify, but they've got the other spouse has enough income to qualify for both, we just leave them off. Well, that's fine to have them left off the loan, but they can both, as you mentioned a moment ago, be co-owners, especially Mm -hmm. if it's their personal residence. Um, Encouraging um, uh, one of the spouses to release their homestead interest or their community property interests Mm -hmm. Um, just because of a credit issue is not really the, the going trend. Yeah, and it seems like it would be the best of both worlds if they were because they have ownership in the property, but they don't. They're not on the liability for the debt. So just finding out and making sure that everybody understands how that's set up. Correct. Right. Exactly. So um, how how does the spouse about go about releasing his or her interest? Well, it's done with a deed. In Washington State, there are different types of deeds. So they, the parties will want to review these types of deeds before making a decision. Um, and there's a few ways to get these documents prepared. They can have their attorney draw the document um, and the excise tax affidavit that needs to accompany it. Or if the parties are super savvy, they can mm-hmm. prepare the documents themselves. Or they can ask their limited practice officer to prepare the documents, their escrow officer, somebody like myself that's uh-huh. handling the closing, to prepare that document. Um, the the parties absolutely need to provide a written request to the limited practice officer to prepare that document, and and it can be done through an email. And if you're just tuning in right now, I'm actually talking to Julie Booth with uh, Booth Escrow, and we're talking about everything regarding escrow. We're talking a lot about the spouse and not being on uh, the loan. And so why does the spouse have to sign the deed of trust, Julie, if he or she is not going to be on the loan and not the untitled. A lot of people are surprised by that. You know, if they're not going to acquire title, why are they required to sign the deed of trust? Mm-hmm. And it's because of homestead interests. Um, it sounds like this property then would be their uh, primary residence. Uh-huh. And so the, the non-borrowing spouse needs to recognize the debt on their homestead. So, Julie, what about a property in a trust? Or, or, you know, on the lending side, there's a lot more stuff that has to take place for a trust, but I think it's a really good idea to put your property into a trust. Um, are there any special documents needed to sell the property? Yes, the parties need to have a copy of the trust agreement available. Um, really, when the escrow is set up, title's going to okay. want to review that trust agreement, make sure everything's in line, um, the correct parties are signing in the correct way. Um, any uh, future amendments to the trust agreement should be submitted as well. And then having the, the separate tax identification number should be also taken to the closing, okay. the 1099 form. So, Julie, there's a lot of this happening here because our money is so inexpensive. Our real estate market is just unbelievable. And um, foreign people, are, are they're coming in and investing in our real estate because they can't get the return um, in their country on their money. So what about someone coming in and using foreign money to close. I suggest they talk to their bankers right Mm -hmm. away. Get that stuff moving. Find out what the conditions are. Don't wait until the last minute because chances are you're going to miss your closing date. Yeah. Talk to your bank. Makes makes great sense. Um, Are there any special considerations for foreign sellers? Uh, Not if the sales price is less than $300,000 and the buyer or a member of the buyer's family will be residing in the property as their primary residence. But if your transaction does not meet these requirements and the sellers are not U.S. taxpayers, then 10% of the sales price must be sent to the IRS within 20 days of the close of escrow. Okay. Now, the parties can agree to waive this as escrow's responsibility. However, the buyer may end up with a lien by the IRS on the property in the future. Um, The seller can apply for a waiver or a reduction, um, but the buyer must agree to this and it should be done and handled prior to the close of escrow. So, Julie, we talked a little bit when I've, I was, ta- was talking with uh, Mark about fraud. And I mean, there's just so much more of that going on in the industry uh, now. How can you protect protect yourself from fraud? I have a few tips. Um, take a moment to verify that the companies that you've chosen to do business with are licensed and bonded. Mm-hmm. Your escrow officer and loan officer will be licensed with the Department of Financial Institutions in Washington and easy to verify. And if they aren't, then they shouldn't be doing mortgages. That's exactly mm-hmm. right. Uh, you want to vet your people, right? We hear a lot about that word these days. Yeah. Um, escrow closers that work for title companies are exempt from this licensing. 
Never, never email non-public personal information without being password protected yeah. or encrypted. And expect your providers to send your NPPI via an encrypted system or with a password that is sent, sent in a separate email. Um, most of these systems are user-friendly. Just keep track of your passwords because chances are you're going to be um, sent that exact program mm-hmm. in a later email. Uh, now, my IT people um, think maybe I'm a little nuts with this, but if you do online banking at all, use a dedicated computer to do that. Don't really? do anything else but online banking with that computer. And okay. this, this keeps you from accidentally downloading programs that hackers have installed behind wow. innocent looking things to steal your keystrokes That's and a great your passwords. Idea. Well, and I think about people just if they do the simple things that we know that we should do, and a lot of people don't. How many people use their same password for everything? And so I don't understand why even the simple things people are not doing that. But um, that's an um, amazing idea. And what about modifications, loan modifications? Well, I brought a few tips right off the DFI website. Um, a warning sign of a possible loan modification scam is if the company is operating out of state. If the company is not licensed with the DFI, Mm -hmm. the company claims that a license is not required because there are attorneys involved. If the out-of-state attorneys are not licensed to practice in Washington State, Mm -hmm. if the money is if money is required up front before any paperwork is reviewed or signed, if the company tells you not to contact your lender, or obviously if the company requires direct access to your bank account or credit card. Always, always consult an attorney if something doesn't feel quite right. It's so exciting to do this show because I just have really the best of the best in studio. I mean, everybody that comes into studio is at the top of their field, and we can all be experts in one area, I think, and we've got three different experts in, well, four and counting myself, in uh, different arenas. And if there's any questions that you have for Julie regarding escrow, um, pick up the phone and give her a call, one 855 That's my show number. We can directly connect you to Julie. Again, it's one Eight five five four hundred eleven fifty, or online at themoneyhour.com. And you can actually go online to themoneyhour.com and search for Julie's name, type in escrow, and you'll see her segments. And you can actually re-listen to uh, her podcast if we went through f- too fast for some of this information. Julie, again, thank you for coming back into studio. It's always a pleasure to have you here and look forward to uh, to the next time you come back and share some more information. Thanks, Tina. It was fun. Coming up next in the money hour, how do you drive more traffic to the web, to your website? How do you increase your business? Deborah Trapin with D11 Consulting right here on 1150 KKNW after the short break.